Welcome to the Ignorance of Strength Podcast. I'm your host, Fabian motherfucking Ojeda, and I don't know shit, but that's okay. All right, all right, let's get this shit started. Thank you, everybody, for listening to the Ignorance of Strength Podcast. Hope you all enjoyed episode number 73 with Crystal Ball and Albert, uh, some of Whitey's boys. We'll make sure to have them back on again uh very soon definitely interesting conversation different topics that we haven't talked about but uh you know always interesting to switch it up there we're back today though with a brand new guest uh i'm very excited to have him on um you know been reading about him uh and 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 his story i think is a is a good one to have on the podcast you know we like to again like to switch it up have different topics on um and today we really want to have one you know for uh for the veterans listening and and Mr. or Mr. Michael Stephen Myers has a very uh, interesting story to tell um, about you know being 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 uh, in the Vietnam War, overcoming you know some struggles there with PTSD, and 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 really harnessing you know everything and 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 putting it into his his plays, right? So I want to welcome to the podcast, Mr. Michael Stephen Myers. How are you doing today? Hey, good. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And it's your middle name, Stephen, right? Stephen, that's correct. Yeah, I was gonna, you know, I was gonna say Michael Myers, but I was gonna say no, yeah, yeah. not that Michael Myers. You ever get that? Get, oh yeah, scared. all the time. It's either <laughs> Mike Myers, the comedian, or Michael Myers, the Halloween guy. Ah, uh-huh, yeah. <laughs> I always, when I, whenever, I, when somebody says your name is Michael Myers, and I'm, yeah, I'm getting a service thing or something, I always say, yeah, and I got my knife out in the truck and my mask, so you better be nice to me. You know? <laughs> So, yeah, um, and every, I can imagine everybody that ever knew me when they first divulged that the murderer in the Halloween movie's name was Michael Myers. Everybody went, oh, man, I know him. Yeah. They're like, it makes sense. No? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It does make sense. Yeah. But, you know, uh, we talked uh, a little bit before press and record. And, and like I said, I, you know, I really want to make sure we tell your story. It's, you know, I think it's 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 super interesting, but it's important, you know, especially yeah. in today's climate to kind of you know, give some, give some, uh, give some hope to some people, you know, because, um, we're going to touch on, on, on PTSD and, you know, I, I've got, you know, my brother who, who, you know, he was in, uh, infantry. Uh, I got a good friend who's on the podcast a lot, uh, who was also air, you know, airborne and, and they, they, you know, they've seen some stuff and, um, a lot of the time, you know, it's, it's, it's not easy to see them, experiencing you know ptsd you know like my brother can't even uh hear the, hear fireworks on fourth of july you know right, um right so i mean yeah that, that, definitely, uh, def- yeah. definitely uh you know uh you know excited to have you on and just to tell, tell what's going on so i want to get uh you know started like i'd like to sometimes i like to frame the picture let people know you know who we're talking to and, and go kind of chronology chronologically okay. um you know where did where did you grow up well my father was a naval officer for 31 years, mm. so we I grew up all over the world, but I was born and did a lot of my years in Virginia, mm-hmm. Virginia Beach, where I happen to be now, and my father was from California, my mother was from this area, so I lived on one coast or the other as mm. home, home base, but, you know, we lived in Japan and Germany and traveled all over the world, and then I left home when I was 17. Well, wow. so I became a, an, I had a, my girlfriend who was a cheerleader and I was a ball player and somehow she got pregnant. I'm still trying to figure that one out, but, <laughs> but, uh, I had a baby on the way, so I had to make some decisions. So my father, the Naval officer decided he laid me, he laid out how in nine years, if I worked really hard, I could be a chief, and mm-hmm. then, you know, that's, and the sea, I, we've been across both oceans twice and I got seasick as a dog. So I knew that I wanted to be on the ground. So I ended up joining the army the day after I got married at 17 years old. Mm-hmm. But when I was a child, though, we traveled all over the world and I had a couple of really good childhood memories. Uh, one was my uncle was uh, who just died recently, was one of the last World War II veterans in our family. Wow. He flew uh, B-17s in Europe as a young captain. Uh, the B-17 was the big fortress, the bomber that went over uh, Europe. Mm-hmm. And he, and when you flew 28 missions over Europe or anywhere, when you threw, flew 28 bombing missions, you were automatically became a member of the, what they called the Lucky Bastards Club. Mm-hmm. He flew 38 missions. Oof. And 
in war, and then in Korea, he flew jets. He was one of the first jet pilots in Korea, battle combat pilots. And then in Vietnam, he was a, a forward air observer. So he did monitor, he coordinated bombers. He flew three wars, and he just died recently. But I, I had a childhood memory from him. We, my father was, in, we were in Bremerhaven, Germany, which was a southern port in Germany. Mm-hmm. And my uncle Jesse was a pilot up in Kaiserslautern, Germany, which is a northern force. And this is the early 50s, not long after the war. I remember the buildings were bombed out. and It was just post-war. I remember Nazi helmets were turned upside down and used in ashtrays, you know. Mm-hmm. And so we visited my cousins up there. And then my dad decided to haul us all back into this old Nash or whatever it was. And we're heading south. And I remember the storks and the windmills and the dikes and the people in all the old cars. And my uncle, everybody said goodbye, but my uncle couldn't be there to say goodbye because he had to fly that day. Mm. So we're about halfway home. And all of a sudden, cars start pulling off the road and you hear this big roar. And here's these two jets that come banking right over the road in front of us. And, and the first one, you saw my uncle wave oh. at us. I mean, that's the type of childhood memory uh, uh, people get when they live in the military. You know, it's oh. amazing. So that that so I have lost a lot of those people, all the World War II vets. I had my father was Iwo Jima, late takeoff in Okinawa kamikaze battles i had an uncle that was at normandy and enzio and the battle of the bulge Mm -hmm. Uh, and then of course my pilot uncle so every my brothers were both served my younger brother never served he uh died uh, in 2019 i think pre-covid we kind of suspect pre-covid he had breathing problems and stuff after heart surgery Mm -hmm. But he was he was doing good. He was a musician. That's how I know Carlos, because they were connected, Carlos Guitarlos. But he uh, he never served. But when he died, surprising to me, he had a DNR, which is do not resuscitate. Wow. And when he died, he gave his body to science and his body went up to Richmond, Virginia, and was used to train army medics and army doctors. And I thought, well, he did serve after all, you know, the yeah. ultimate did really good so i was raised in that and i traveled all over the world lived in japan and germany and saw saw a lot of the world so so it seems like there was no way you weren't going to join the military no i was predestined you know i was just fulfilling my uh duty you know Uh i even had a grandfather that was at gettysburg i had both of my grandfathers at gettysburg one on the hill and one charging the hill so that was an amazing history Mm. so i but the history of, of my family goes all the way back to Jamestown. I mean, a lot of people say that, but we have my uh, uh, one of my great grandfathers was Tristan Norsworthy, the original deed owner, deed holder in Isla White County, which is where we started the Jamestown area. Yes. So so the history goes back there. But so it's always been military, military, military. My sons, my uh, oldest son was in the Army Intel for nine years. He's a Ph.D. in computer science now and a member of school board in Lucas, Texas. Mm-hmm. My second son just retired after 28 years in Marine Corps intelligence. He was a retired a colonel. So they it continues, you know, it continues, continues on. So I just did my part. Mm-hmm. Now, the day I served, as, I, I went through and enlisted for three years, became an officer. Went through ranger training, went through uh, jungle training with uh, special forces in Panama before I joined my rifle platoon in Vietnam under fire. Mm-hmm. But I uh, I uh, only served six years because mm-hmm. the day I was due to make captain, I remember the colonel sitting across his desk and the company commander next to him. I looked at my captain bars on the uh, desk and they were going to send I could accept. I had served my obligation. I was done. So I had a choice. I could stay in for a career. I could get out. And I always thought I'd be a career officer, but Mm -hmm. I had been wounded uh, and I had lost a lot of men, felt I could have done a better job. And I only had 40 men. And so I didn't want to go back as a company commander with 200 men. By this time, I had a small family and I had the worst part of the war. And I I just didn't want to die there. You know, I nearly died. First, I didn't want to die there. I didn't want to leave my family. So I gave it up, gave up my career. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, but you know, I thought that the most, the proudest thing I ever did in my life was to lead American soldiers in combat. 
and I loved it when they called me LT. Some of them still called me sir and, and, and lieutenant, but when they called me LT, and I was 21, 22, and they were 18, 19, and the sergeants were in their 30s and 40s, mm-hmm. but I was 22, and when they called me LT, it made me feel like I was one of them. You know, mm-hmm. I was like their big brother instead of their lieutenant, you know? Right. Mm-hmm. But I, no. I, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, I'll go, go right ahead. I'll ask afterwards. Yeah. But I could have, I felt like I could have done a better job. So, so I walked away. I gave it up. I regretted it for years, but I, but I gave it up. But, but that, so I thought the most honorable thing I ever did was to lead them in combat until when I was phasing out, I was at Fort Benning, Georgia, and they made me officer in charge of funeral detail. Mm. Now I'm burying these guys that are dying in Vietnam, three, sometimes five, sometimes 10 a month. And that became my most honorable duty because it was struck, we were sharp. I was the one that gave the next kin the flag and saluted him and said on behalf of the United States and, and so forth. Mm-hmm. So that became my most honorable duty until, uh, like I said before, when I came back, I started writing as a catharsis. I was part of HBO's, the input of HBO's Vietnam War Story series, which was their first successful series in the 80s. Right. 1980, I think it was. And so I did that, and then I I put, also did a little input in Tales from the Crypt, but the with Vietnam War Story series was the first one. But mm-hmm. this same psychiatrist that I may have mentioned before that said I was different than most Vietnam veterans, that somehow I wasn't running away from it, I had turned to embrace it. Mm-hmm. Now, really quick before we get there, Mike, I just wanted to go back a little bit, uh-huh. um, and... and um, you know, I, I wanted to, to, to touch on, you know, that you being 17 years old, you know, you're right uh, in the middle of, of, of Vietnam War. Was there any hesitation on your part uh, joining then? Because, I mean, the, 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 you know, the political climate, the social climate must have been, you know, super crazy back then because, um, you yeah. know, there was just so much turmoil and it was such a country divided, right? Yeah, so was yeah. there any hesitation on your part in joining or um, did you no, just I, know? No, I joined in 1964. Mm. That was before it really heated up. The Gulf of Tonkin, I, I think, was 65 or somewhere around in 67, 68. I can't remember. Okay. The war had, and I just lost a really good friend. And I don't know if you, of Joseph L. Galloway, who wrote We Were Soldiers Once and Young. You're probably familiar with the movie. We were soldiers mm. with Mel Gibson. That's half the book. But mm. I became friends with Joe. And just two months ago, I had breakfast with him. I even invited him to my wedding. I'm getting married in uh, October. Well, but congratulations. I, I, yeah, thank you. I even invited him to my wedding. We had breakfast. And we talked about LZ X-Ray, which he was in. And and I knew that he, even though he was not a, a soldier, he got the Bronze Star for pulling a soldier out of, com, uh, out of harm's way. And when we talked about that, he started crying, and I recognized that he had PTSD. Mm. So I did want to mention him because we just lost him just three or four days ago. Great, mm. great American, great, great American, great patriot. And uh, I had breakfast with him, and his wife said, you were a lieutenant? And I said, yeah. And she said, and you're still alive? Because the attrition, <laughs> the attrition weight of lieutenants wasn't very good, you know, under mm. fire. So I think I think I went over with like 126 officers and I think nine of us came back, all of us wounded. So it was, mm-hmm. it was a shoot 'em up, bang, bang, gutsy war. <clears throat> right. And, and then you mentioned, you know, you were in for six years. So at that point, then, you know, things have, have, have probably really kind of heated up then. Right. And yeah. um, I wanted to touch on, you know, your reception when you came back home, yeah. um, because that led to, you know, we we're about to everything we're about to talk about. Right. Um, and so. It wasn't, you know, like the 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 nice homecoming that you see sometimes in the movies and and whatnot. Um, it, it wasn't the feel good kind of uh, homecoming, right? It was yeah. it was a little different for you all. Yeah, yeah. There were no parades, no hellos. <clears throat> when I first got back, <clears throat> I had a layover in San Francisco. I had left my troops just the day before. And so I had just come out of that heat and bloody. When people ask you, what was it like over there? You're thinking about the bugs, the blood, the heat, the dying, the screaming. The, it's just too much to remember. So I just left that the day before. And I'm coming out of the San Francisco airport. And right across the street is hundreds of demonstrators carrying signs and screaming. 
baby killer, murderer, and they were attacking at actually attacking at us, spitting at us and stuff like that. I got in a cab, went over. I wanted to get away from everything, so I went over to Sausalito, California, across the Golden Gate. Mm-hmm. And I remember the first thing I remember was everybody was speeding. Everybody was in a hurry. Every car, everybody was in this tremendous hurry. But I kept, I kept thinking, where, where, where are they in such a hurry? Mm-hmm. You know? And uh, and then I realized that they're just living their lives. You know, they don't know me. So I found a lounge by the water in Sausalito, and there, and I sat there for a while, uh, sipping a red wine, watching the sailboats go by, and trying to unwind, you know, trying to let go, trying to say, well, okay, I'm home, I'm safe, uh, uh, you know, I'm alive. Uh, and then I, I'm, I'm sitting there, and I remember there was American people in there. Mm-hmm. American, they were having a good old time at the bar, drinking and stuff. I just, I wanted to. I wanted a, a hello. I wanted a hey, pat on the back. Good job, you know. Good welcome home. Good job, you know. Mm-hmm. We n- never got that. Never got that. Never got a welcome home. And then, uh, as I'm sitting there, I'm trying to let go of my screams, the dreams, the heat, the bugs, the dying, the killing, and understanding that I'm safe. I wanted to let go of myself, you know. Mm-hmm. And so I'm sitting yeah. there, and I realize something. And I realized something that I would never forget, and that was that the people there, these great American people, they were laughing. They had the nerve to be laughing. And I just left my troops the day before. Mm. So I was offended that they were having so much fun. And I, But I was just another soldier returning home from that unpopular war, you know? Mm-hmm. So, And this was 1969. So I realized that none of them cared. Not, not a single one of them cared. They didn't. They just didn't care. Mm-hmm. It was a harsh reality, you know. So I had worn my uniform because I was proud of it, even though the guys said, "Whatever you do, sir, don't wear your uniform." Mm-hmm. I'm thinking, what do you mean, don't wear my uniform? I'm from a long military family of heroes and people that fought wars for our country. We've done our part. I said, I'm proud to wear my uniform, but, mm-hmm. but nothing, nothing, man. just got nothing. So. That's the, and that was the beginning of my drift, and I call it my 10-year post-Vietnam drift, and I did uh, at one point go up in the mountains, uh, in the Redwood Mountains of Blue Lake, California, among the old logging roads, and lived in a trailer with my dogs, just me and my dogs for a year. And I used to have to brace myself to go down to town to get provisions and stuff because I was scared to death that somebody was going to try and talk to me. <laughs> Now, right. now I have bittersweet feelings because everybody that wears a uniform is a hero. Mm-hmm. A hero. And I think that's fine because I, I, too, thank them and, and think it's great. But and, then, and we hear all the time, oh, thank you for your service. Thank you for your service. Right. That's fine. That's, that's wonderful. You know, I really appreciate those words. But it's a little late. You know, it's a little mm-hmm. late. And the younger generations, like your generation and so forth, are, are more aware more aware of the sacrifices mm-hmm. but but the vietnam veteran learned to hide we learned to hide ourselves and mm-hmm. there's a rule and there here's a rule i want to share with you the ones that talk the most probably saw the least mm. just the standard rule i knew yeah. the rangers i knew the rangers in vietnam i knew the special forces up north and i knew the rangers south and maybe at one time there was Oh, I'd say 5,000 at one time serving a year. And and I bet you I met 100,000 of them in the Mm -hmm. bars since I've been back, the bars. There's no more. You don't meet any sailors or soldiers or riflemen or or Marines. You don't meet anybody that's just a serviceman anymore. They're all recon. I was recon, I was special ops, I was special ops, I was their sniper. I mean, mm-hmm. this, and, and there was a book called Stolen Valor, and I just, I guess, by a guy named Burkett, and I really recommend that book, Stolen mm-hmm. Valor. There's two books. We were Soldiers Once and Young by my friend Joe Galloway that just passed away. I'll be mm-hmm. going to service on the 18th in North Carolina. And the other one is Stolen Valor, the two Bibles of my war, I think. Mm-hmm. Movies, if you want to know what movies to watch about my war, well, there's some terrible ones, 
John Landis Twilight Zone was the biggest insult I'd ever had. I mean, and soldiers that are listening to you, veterans will understand that here's this one scene that all you hear is this blaring rock and roll music and all this splashing and noise. And all of a sudden, these all these guys are bunched up walking through the weeds and they're smoking a joint, passing a joint around with this music blaring on the radio, talking about how they fragged Lieutenant so-and-so the night before. Mm. Terrible, terrible insult. Just the stupidest movie. And unfortunately, Vic Morrow died making that movie, but it was just terrible insult and then platoon came along platoon oliver stone obviously had a problem with the authority he was a rear area soldier evidently did a lot of drugs and stuff but the story itself was just ridiculous about two sergeants fighting each other smoking pot mm. we were out there we were in the infantry that we were too concerned with staying alive to be out of our minds and stupid i mean it was just just so insulting Rambo, another insult. I mean, everybody thinks it's <laughs> a loose cannon. And for many years there, every time uh, somebody that broke the law or something serious, they'd always say, they'd always investigate and always say, oh, yeah, he was a Vietnam veteran, which I guess that makes it okay that he's nuts, you know. Mm-hmm. That, that we had to live that with that. So all that stuff's going on. There are a couple of good ones. We were soldiers that I mentioned. It's a good one. Uh, Hamburger Hill. I love Hamburger Hill because it shows the interaction of the soldiers and dying. And that's a good one. And Full Metal Jacket by Stanley Kubrick, of course, uh, uh, with Matthew Modine. Mm -hmm. That's a good movie in itself, period. But it's also the first half is about training. And then the second half is pretty, pretty vivid action of way and the fight and fighting that went on in way. Mm -hmm. Those those are the good movies. That's that's what I'd recommend. Yeah, I actually, uh, I'm surprised you said, uh, you know, uh, we didn't like Platoon uh, just because I hear so many people like when they put over war movies, like, oh, that's one of the great ones, Platoon. But I, I, it was interesting to get your uh, perspective on that one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was, uh, it was, it, it, I found it very insult. I found it enjoyable in the fact that it would put me back on the ground with troops, but the story just went stupid. I mean, Mm. Oliver Stone is not my favorite uh, director or writer, and he was a veteran of Vietnam, but not he wouldn't have been in my platoon. Let's put it that way. Mm. I would have sent him out of there in a minute. (laughs) So he's one of those guys that probably did the most talking, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't know, (laughs) but you'll meet him. You'll meet him. And you have to be aware and like my brother, who uh, the recent, the brother that died in 2019 was a musician in L.A. Mm-hmm. And he had a, a friend named Bob that was an actor, uh, been a lot of lot of things. And every time Robin was with Bob, he's always telling me that Bob did this and Bob did that in Vietnam. You know, he was this in Vietnam. And I said, really, really? I said, I'll have to meet him sometime. And then just by chance, one day I was with my brother and we went over to Bob's house. And Robin said, oh, yeah, Bob, this is um, this is my brother, Michael. He was a lieutenant in Vietnam. And and, and, we, and, and the first thing a, a soldier says to get to know him is, oh, yeah, what year were you there? What what unit? You know, and then you connect that way. So I said, well, really, Bob, what year was were you there? What unit were you with? He says, I was never in Vietnam. Just shut it down completely. Just yeah. all that bullshit that he was feeding everybody was yeah. was just that bullshit. And wow. a lot of times you'll find that. And if you're talking to somebody about their service, say, yeah, I was a sniper, or, yeah, I was black ops, or yeah, I was special ops, or yeah, I was recon or force re. I mean, you know, you gotta. They won't do that with me. Mm-hmm. I don't. I don't go out there to bust anybody. But they won't do that with a real veteran because right. they don't ask them certain questions like your MOS or whatever. You know, or what unit you were with, or what years, you know, and, and usually it's younger people that would be too young to have been in it in any way in Vietnam. Mm-hmm. Nowadays it's a different. Nowadays we got a different kind of war. We just we just getting out of a twenty, not not very clean, but we're getting out of it a twenty year mistake, right? And people have yeah been yeah, out of mind. and uh, so. I just, you know, I feel for that. And then these guys that just died, just trying to help people. I mean, so there's a lot of PTSD that's coming at us, mm-hmm. which took me to my writing because that doctor said, uh, write it down, write it down, get it out of you. At what point did you meet this doctor when you were uh, kind of isolated or or did you? Well, uh, when I went, when I was in the mountain, like, like from the time 69, when I came back, it was a blur. 
until 80, right? Mm-hmm. I did a lot of jobs. And everything. I mean, I was just, just existing, right? Mm. But I then I went up in the mountains. When I came down on the mountain, I went to that vet center. That was in early to mid 80s. Mm-hmm. And that's when I started healing. That's when I started. And that's when about that time I got with that doctor. Okay. And that's VA psychiatrist. And he said, write it down. Or Jack Jones, one of them said, you got to write it. You're going to need the catharsis. You need to vent. You need to vent. Or else you're walking around all ready to explode, right? Mm-hmm. So I vented. So I took six dental pads, sat in my car in front of my house, and filled them. Mm-hmm. Just, I just regurgitated everything I could think of that happened. And then when I had the six dental pads done, I realized I'd only touched the surface. There's so much in there after a year and a half of constant. It, here's a statistic. I'll get back to that stental pad. That here's a statistic that a lot of people aren't aware of because we think of the World War II veterans with the parades and the heroes and they won their war mm-hmm. and we're a bunch of crybabies and so forth. That's the way we were treated. But the statistics are this. The World War II infantry soldier, combat infantry soldier, and granted, they saw a lot of battles, a lot of terrible, terrible battles. But the World War II infantry soldier in four years saw an average of about 44 days of actual fighting combat. Okay. Mm -hmm. The Vietnam infantry soldier in one year saw an average of over 200 days of actual fighting combat. Well, yeah. So, and it was a jungle, dirty, hot, bloody mess, you know? Mm -hmm. You're just trying to stay alive. So we kept each other alive. And there's no color in war. There's no color in war. The only colors we we wore the same color green, we bled the same color red, and we mm-hmm. were under the same red, white, and blue. All we were were Americans. Mm-hmm. No color in war. So it, it, it's impossible for somebody like me. I was just talking about it last night to be to have any kind of awareness about a skin color the first man i saw killed was my platoon sergeant and i'm great friends with his son who was five years old then and he's a a, he was a large black great airborne american you know Mm -hmm. so i think the world will the world will change when people stop seeing a person's skin color you know Mm -hmm. just realize we're just people but that that is a real important thing so back to my uh steno pads Mm -hmm. I had a horrible year, as we all did, and, uh, September 11th, 9-11, when the towers went down, and right. people were jumping, and these people were having these life and death decisions, having to jump to their death. That happened, and I watched that with the lady I was with for 22 years in California, Patty, beautiful girl, and mm-hmm. I watched that with her, and then that, and then I had to go be in plays. I was an actor, so I was, I was recruited for three plays in Northern California. And I had a house in Idaho at that time. So I was traveling back and forth to California. And I went to California up north, a place called Ferndale, to a movie town. Mm-hmm. And I did three plays that year. And the dog, I took my special dog with me. Sport was a border collie, smartest dog I ever knew, taught me all his tricks. And he, uh, he got cancer and died that Christmas. So 9-11. Mm-hmm. And then cancer and killed my dog on Christmas. And then after that, I'm finishing up the plays, getting ready to come back to Idaho, and I call I I'll call Patty every day and I talk to her, say how are you doing. Mm-hmm. So I, I didn't get hold of her one day. That's okay. Didn't get hold of the second day, not unheard of. Didn't get hold of her the third day. So I called her mother, and her mother said, "Are you sitting down?" So I knew that my life had changed at that moment. She died while I was away playing on stage. Ooh. So I never I never acted again after that. I, I started writing and directing. So. Bang, bang, bang. Three big things happened right there. Yeah. To a guy that already had enough difficulties just trying to keep his head on straight, you know. And so I started, I came back to Virginia where I had extended family and I've been here ever since. That was 2002. And now I've been really fortunate. I met a beautiful lady a couple of years ago and and we're going to go ahead and take that, try to tie that knot, you know. So there you go. Very, very fortunate man. To, but anyway. I started writing and then I decided, well, okay, what am I going to do with it? And I knew acting. I knew how to blot. So I knew how to visualize. And so I took my work and made it into one play. And I called it Badges of Honor. Gave it some structure, you know. 
not about medals, but about our dreams. Our mm. dreams are our badges of honor, our moments of dignity. You know, and a veteran has to remember that. Those are our moments of dignity that other people don't get to live. And if we lost somebody in that dignity, it only makes sense to live the rest of your life in dignity and honor. You know, if you don't, then you're insulting the people you left behind. You know what I mean? Yeah. I want the veterans to feel that and hear that, you know, to keep their head up, to remember that, that it's, it's their duty to never let those soldiers and those people be forgotten, you know. And the mm -hmm. way they can do that is to live their life in dignity, to be right, to do the right things, you know? So, you know, I was reading on your bio, you know, that that touches on the, uh, you know, the whole concept of, of, uh, of suicide, right? Like there's so many, so many you know, uh, veterans with PTSD that commit suicide. Yeah. Um, that's yeah. I mean, it's super unfortunate. I think you, uh, did you know, you, you, you mentioned the statistics earlier, right? Yeah, 22 a day up to about a year or so ago. And most of those were uh, Vietnam veterans, but now we have a whole bunch of new veterans that are troubled and suffering from PTSD. And, mm -hmm. and they're in that, what, like I described in my 10 year post Vietnam drift, they're missing a piece of them. They're missing their normal youth, you know, Y-O-U-T-H. They're missing being young. They, they, they became a soldier instead or a Marine and they learned how to kill and kill and be kill, kill or be killed, kill quick. And so they learned that. So the one thing they never taught us, like I was trained very well. I, I went, to, I went to OCS. I was an enlisted man for three years, went through OCS, officer candidate school, Fort Benning, Georgia, went through Ranger leadership training, Ranger night patrol training, Ranger all through this training without being a, a, a Ranger. But I, I, I was ranger trained. And then I went to uh, jungle training in Panama with special forces. So I, and, and the government spent a lot of money to train a young officer like that mm -hmm. and then send me to a war that was going on, Tet 68, joining my rifle tune under fire. And so I was I was trained well and I was I, I knew what I was doing. I was good. I was as good as America had, you know, at the time I mm. was I, I, and I did my duty and we fought this war like we were supposed to fight this war. We charge when we're supposed to charge, when the natural reaction is to run from danger. We, as long as that guy was on your right and your left and you were moving forward, you were good, you know. Mm -hmm. But then you'd see this guy fall and this guy fall. It's amazing that. Uh, that uh, you can see so much death so quickly sometimes. So there's a lot of trouble from that. And suicide was up to 22 a day. Now, I don't know what it is now, but I know it's still high. And all these new veterans that have experienced these things, they're in that drift like I was. And they, they have to, maybe my work can help them rediscover themselves a little quicker. And I talk about pride, like leading them in combat, burying them. It's my duty now, I feel, to help them find their way back home. Mm -hmm. And at home, I mean to themselves, to find themselves, to find that missing piece. Maybe even if I can help them a little quicker. I had one guy in the Redwood area where I lived 10 years and then 10 years later I lived there. During the time when I got went to the session and started healing, and then in the 90s when I was acting at the turn of the century, I went back there, same area, and a guy, pro I, I had a get together one time with my actor friends and my veteran buddies, mm -hmm. and a guy pulled me aside in the kitchen. He said, Michael, said, I want you to know that you said something to me 10 years ago that changed my life. Mm -hmm. He was a veteran, and I said, really, what was it? He said, well, I don't want to go there because that would have been his trouble, but he said, I just wanted you to know that you changed my life, and I thought, wow, man. That's that's fantastic. And then another one. I had a play that was featured in uh, D.C. and I happened to be in the audience and he introduced me and a, a Marine, a combat veteran Marine, probably from Iraq, came up to me and said, you were there, weren't you? And I said, yeah, yeah. And he said, well, I could tell because the words you were using thing. So he, too, benefited from it. So I realized that my work, which is a lot of post-war healing stuff. Mm -hmm. helps soldiers and Marines find their way back home, back to themselves. So I, I feel like I'm just as proud of what I'm doing now as what I did then. Mm -hmm. So 
Speaking of suicide, my most recent play, you probably read a little bit about it on my webpage, is A Soldier's Final Act. Mm-hmm. Originally, it was called A Soldier's Final Act of Kindness, and then it was, became A Soldier's Final Act of Redemption. And then I shortened it to A Soldier's Final Act. Because, so we all know about the suicide rates that I mentioned, but we don't know who they are, right? So I introduced them in this play to a soldier that, an, an officer who has illogically found his way to the logical assumption of ending, ending his tour of duty, so to speak, to ending his life. And he reaches out to the VA for help and he reaches his family and he reaches his therapist and his doctor and gets to run around and, and he's just made up his mind. So it's almost like the HBO show Room 401 or 104, whatever that is, where a lot of things happen in the same hotel room. So he takes his life in this hotel room. And then in the second act, there's a troubled girl that's 16 goth and her dad and her mom are there in the same hotel room to visit their son who has been injured in a football accident uh, incident. And the son was a quarterback and his dad's real proud of him. And he's never approved of his daughter and his daughter's having problems with her bullying, sexuality or her independence. She's goth. She's got all this black and spikings and stuff and green hair. And But she's having a real problem. And this whole thing happens between the family in there. The father finally gets disgusted and leaves. And the mother eventually sides with the father and leaves and leaves the daughter there and the daughter's there distraught and the mother has left her purse with her pills in it the daughter decides to take her life and that's the end of act two she's taking pills act three begins and suddenly the spirit of the veteran that killed himself in act one appears through smoke and stuff and he appears and he's wondering where he's at he doesn't remember anything he's just kind of wandering in this limbo he still got his uniform on and stuff and and he sees the little girl laying on the bed, taking these pills. And he talks to her and frightens her. And she doesn't see him, but she senses him because she's kind of clairvoyant. So he talks to this girl and she never sees him through this whole thing. He's never visible to anybody except the audience. And they have true conversation through these conversations. And it goes everywhere. It's nice stuff. Talks about her and him. And he's remembering while he's talking to her. He's remembering maybe what he did. You know, and, and then he freaks out and he says, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know, and he talk, wait a minute, it was right there. And he talks and then he realizes that he left his little girl. He left his little girl and his wife. And, and he talked to her about that bond, that golden cord between the two of them that, yes, your daddy does love you. You know, and he talked to her like that and that he, 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 he killed, he did that. He did that and it hurt them and it hurts him that she, when she commits suicide, she's cutting that golden cord that that love cord between the two of them. It's okay if we think about the people we love because that's self-centered and that's the way we are. You know, we love people and that's a good feeling to love people, right? But just as important, if not even more important, is who loves us. And when we make that decision to cut that cord, it kills them too. You know what I mean? So it's not right. a good decision. So he convinces her that there's a better way. That, that And it's too late. She's already taken enough pills. The parents come back. She collapses on the bed. The father grabs her. They're in a panic. And she was talking to the spirit. The father says, who, who was she? Or the mother says, who was she talking to? And he says, he was talking to us. And and she's saying, I love you, daddy. I love you. And, and it's a real emotional scene. And it, what happens is the spirit kind of walks over. Remember, the parents can't see him leans over the father's shoulder and touches the girl just as she collapses and oh, dying on the chest and says, it's not your time, little girl. And then the little girl gasps to life and there's all kinds of hugging and loving and crying. And the veteran again wanders upstage or on screen and a bright light appears and he goes into the light and he disappears. He's redeemed. So it's called a soldier's final act about suicide. Mm-hmm. And it gives it shows it shows it talks about things that people need to hear and gives you an alternative and it gives you a reason to not make such an illogical decision, you know. Right. That people uh, love you how how I mean that's super creative there. You know, I would 
I understand, you know, you, you, um, you know, you're, you're finding ways to deal with your own PTSD, but you know, how, what were the first steps to, to making that, to, to writing that? I mean, that's, it's pretty deep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I just wrote that about a year ago. Uh, and people helped me. My lady helped me and my lady, Linda, I bounce, you know, I'd, le- I'd read parts to people and, and say, what about this? What about this? And then it, would just, it just came to me and I'm watching HBO's room. I, I believe it's 401, if I'm not mistaken, it might be 104, but it's, it's like a twilight zone thing where everything happens in this room. And, and I thought I can do that. I can write, I can write something that takes place in one room, you know, a hotel room. So it just came and then the suicide came. And then the, the other thing that I had written for Tales from Clip was called Billy and the One-Armed Bandit. I did kind of the same thing. I took a veteran, but Billy is a woman, and she has some traumatic events that makes her go crazy, and and she ends up, uh, and it's a horror story, so she ends up getting eaten by a slot machine demon, and it's really, really pretty, pretty scary, but pretty good. But I rewrote it, included the jumpers. 9-11 happened. And we all know, we all watched in horror as these people fell off the side of the building or jumped to their death, the sudden instant decision that, I mean, that's a difficult, difficult thing, but we don't know who they were, right? So I took one of my main characters in this story and two other people, and I introduced the audience or the reader to these people, and you got to be with them and what they were doing at the Windows of the World restaurant. And then if they see the thing hit and it hits and all the panic they're going through and the smoke and the fire and these three people make the decision to jump together. And it's an amazing. So I introduced people to who those jumpers were, you know, it's three, I gave them three of them and it's meaty and it's visceral and it's gutsy and it's sad, but, but really, really a good story, a good story. But that's that particular kind of story. So that would that's a different uh, genre, so to speak. I hate that word, but uh-huh. <laughs> genre, you know. Yeah. Where where can people, you know, see, is there somewhere people can see these plays if they wanted to? Or right now, um, right now because of COVID, you know, it shut me down for productions and stuff like that. I couldn't really produce it. I, last year, I would have really wanted to have it a successful year. So I'm thinking this year. Uh, but right now, the only thing I could suggest is to visit my webpage. I'll, I keep it updated and it has my email there. So anybody can write me on that web page or they can visit and see what the work is, the work that I'm talking about. And uh, so I, it's all in the process. So there's nothing right now. However, it's been suggested to me that I do a podcast. I don't know the first thing about a podcast, but to help veterans. So it's like I've got two things. I'm a writer. And I'm an award-winning playwright. I, you know, the first, the first time that first play I took, I broke it down into three one-act plays, and I entered a play festival with it, and I won the play festival, and then I won like six awards: best play, best audience choice play, actors, uh, director. And I remember when we were rehearsing this play, it was about veterans. Uh, all the, there was like 15 other plays in this contest, and they would all come into our closed rehearsal. And sit in the audience, I said, well, what are you doing here? And they said, well, we heard this play was so good, we had to be here. So it was an amazing transformation from a troubled combat decorated veteran to a playwright, you know. But I suddenly re- I realized that people enjoyed what I had to say. It was It was helping people. So that, here I am today, and I just want to get this stuff out. So please visit my webpage, send me an email. If somebody's listening that, that, that has production values or places or whatever, help me get it up and running. You know, that's all I can say. And I, I don't like to self-promote, you know, the PTSD. I mean, I was, you know, I was a decorated army officer, did my duty, uh, wounded and uh, lost a lot of good men. And so I, the last thing I want to do is self-promote myself, you know, but I, I've been given this gift of writing and acting. So I, I was able to put it to work and it helped heal me. And I'm hoping that it'll help heal a lot of families, a lot of veterans, especially these new guys, these new guys. Yeah, Michael. So, I mean, I know you don't want to self-promote, but I want to make sure, too, you know, you get the word out. You know, so what's your what's your website again, Michael, for everybody? Myers, And that's spelled S-T-E-P-H-E-N. M-Y-E-R-S, 
Myers, not M-E-Y, M-Y-E-R-S, dot com. That'll take you right to my webpage. You can read about the plays and scripts that I've written. You can read about my background. You can read uh, some other things on there that I'm working on. And my email is right in the middle of it. And there's some photographs of when I was in the war and stuff. So ranger training and post stuff. So, yeah, feel feel free. I, one thing I don't have on there is the little trophies that I got. I've, I've got them in storage right now. So, but um, yeah, that's what I'd recommend. I, and get in contact with me. If they want to drop me an email, you know, I'd be more than happy. And I'd be more than happy to appear on these things, that, you know, especially if you have veterans. That's how Are you a veteran, by the way? Are you a veteran? No, I am not. No. Um, you know, I, 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 I think I mentioned to you beforehand, I, I was really hoping to have uh, uh, one of my veteran uh, co-hosts oh, yeah, on. Yeah. on. Uh, you know, you just couldn't do it today, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, but I know you'll be listening. And, and, you know, I would love to have you on at some point again. Anytime. Uh, be my honor, man. But, you know, also, I'm, I'm glad you're thinking about that podcast. I think it would help a lot of people out. Um, you know, it's not too difficult. You know, all you got to do is jump on Zoom. You know, if you know somebody who can who can edit it or, you know, if you wanted to send it out to get e- edited. Um, and you can, well, I, used, you can, I did a TV show. I used to edit it, too. So I, 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 oh, yeah. simple. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, well, I, it sounds interesting. I mean, I think I was talking with Linda last night about it. And we decided that it might be a good tool, you know, if I could help a veteran, like a one-on-one with the, like you're doing, uh, and and it might be beneficial. Who knows? You know, who knows? It's worth a try, you know? So I'm thinking, seriously thinking about it. That's why I asked you in the beginning, Spotify and Apple, you suggested. So I don't know the first thing about creating one. I know I know how to do a camera, you know, and a microphone, but, and I, and I imagine the Zoom you know, the, the Zoom uh, gives you that capability. So great, great uh, instrument. For sure. Yeah. I mean, if you need any help, but if you ever want any help uh, doing that, I'll, I'll be glad to, you know, give you some pointers on that. It's not that difficult. I, I guarantee you, because if it was difficult, I wouldn't be doing it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, but, you know, on a final kind of, you know, note here before we uh, close out, you know, mm-hmm. we only scratch the surface and, right. and there's, you know, there's a lot of meat on the bone still, I think, but, you know, uh, and this might be kind of a loaded question, but there's a lot, as you mentioned, you know, a lot of a lot of the the, the new kids essentially, right, that are going to be experiencing this PTSD that they may not know how to, you know, handle it or or you know how to how to deal with it. Um, I mean, I know you you had your own way. Um, of, of getting, you know, counseling and help for that. But what would you, I mean, what are some, what are some pointers if even you can give some pointers for something like that? I know it's a difficult question, but well, what are some pointers to start okay. healing? You know, right. I'd say number one, and they've heard this before, eat the pain, eat the pain. And there's something called the walk in the red road that my Shoshone brother shared with me. Keep walking forward, stay in balance. Don't don't get too sad. Don't get too angry. Don't get too happy. Just stay in the middle. Walk in balance. You can only leave one set of footprints in the sand. So you want to make sure they're deep and everlasting and not ridiculous walking in circles. Make sure that you're in balance with everything in harmony with all other living things. Don't kill anymore. And just hold your head up and you know you're going to get through it. You're going to get through it. man. And just remember that it's a scar. What you're experiencing when you get emotional and get upset or sad, it's okay. It's okay to cry. It's okay to get angry as long as you control it. It's like drinking. I I don't mind that a person chooses to drink if they're an adult. I just can't stand to be around somebody that loses control. Don't lose control. You know what I mean? Don't lose control. For those soldiers out there, those new guys, follow me. I might even call my podcast, follow me. You know, that's what the lieutenants did. Follow me again. Follow me home. Remember that there's a piece of you that's missing. You're not going to find it. You're just going to have to realize it and live with it and be a better man because of it. And remember that if you experience things and you saw people die, that is an education and that's an honor. It's an honor. It's your badge of honor to remember those people. Keep your head up. Keep your head up. Walk, Walk tall. Yeah, definitely valuable advice there. Um, I thank you, uh, Michael. I, I I really I enjoyed this. You know, I think um, 
again, you, you know, there's so much more to kind of, uh, you know, pick at and, 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 and really kind of, uh, you know, get, get into what, what you're, you're thinking with your plays and, you know, some of, some more of your history and whatnot. Um, so the story, you know, so there's more of the story we can tell at some point for sure. I'd like to have that. Yeah. Um, next time, next time I'll share some of my work. I'll do some, I'll get my laptop here and do a little reading from it if you'd like. So you can start nice. to hear some of that stuff from that, uh, that soldier, for instance, that whole first act mm-hmm. is one man, one man play. And he's basically talking to the audience and he's talking to ghosts and they're yeah. my ghosts. They're my stories. So those are interesting. Those are interesting. I, I would suggest maybe when you get those plays going, you know, Record them, put them on YouTube. I think uh, a lot of people might want to see those, you know? Yeah, I think that's a good idea. For sure. I, I have some stuff out there that I was acting in, but I, I won't, I, you know, that, that's different, different. This is different. Well, okay. yeah, send me your email again so I, so I know, uh, so I can put you on there. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're, you're, I, I, you're a pretty decent guy. I like you. Oh, thank uh, you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate, I appreciate you. And it was an honor being on your podcast. For sure. It helps a lot of people. Definitely. So, yeah, uh, again, pleasure having you on. And uh, for everybody listening at home, I appreciate it. Thank you. Fuck Thank you and good you. night. on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts. Like, follow, and share on Facebook and Instagram at Ignorance of Strength Podcast and on Twitter at The Ignorance Pod.